just like the way it looks going down the road, you know? After all the uh, McLaren F1s and the uh, Ford GTs and the P1s and all the fast cars we've done, we're kind of slowing things down a bit this week with this one. This is a 1950 Plymouth Suburban. This car was about a utilitarian vehicle as you could get. It was sold to the working man. That was the idea. It was a two-door station wagon. It was revolutionary and it was Plymouth's I think America's first all steel station wagon. You know, most station wagons of the period either had some wood framing or a wood back part, hence the term woody. This is the first all steel one. It's a two door. Most were four doors, but this was a car sold to the guy that maybe he was a plumber or a construction guy or a real estate agent, and uh, he wanted something dependable to get around. The engine is about 217 cubic inches. It's a flathead engine, it's six cylinder, it's 97 horsepower, it's got a three speed transmission. This is what my dad would call a good old girl, just a good, reliable, basic American transportation. I came home from the hospital in one of these, a 1949 model, not the station wagon, but the coupe, and it had the mohair upholstery, and to this day, I, it, it always smelled like a wet dog when it was damp outside, so whenever I get in one of those old cars, oh, it smells like a wet dog. We had that car until I was seven years old, and we went everywhere with it, and it never broke, and my father loved it until we got a 57 Plymouth Belvedere which rested out in uh, about three years. But I always remember these. I, I just like these very much. The idea was, even in the ad, they say you could wash out the interior with soap and water and a sponge. Just take a hose, clean the whole thing because it's made of, what did they say, luxurious plastic. It's, it's great. It's got drum brakes, top speed, maybe 75 miles an hour. This car likes to go between 45 and 60, maybe stay on this side of 60. But you know, when I get in it and I drive it, it's just so relaxing to drive. It's got a nice tube radio. When you turn it on, it goes, hmm, it warms up. You hear it hum, and then the radio plays. And you know, the whole world just slows down a bit when you have one of these. It's a great car to go for ice cream or a slice of pizza or something like that. I wouldn't want to drive to San Francisco in it. But for getting around town or going to uh, you know one of the big box stores to pick up some lumber or something like that, that's what it was built for. That's what makes it kind of cool. This one has a few options on it. Very decorative here. These door protectors here, a handle protector. It's got the fender skirts. Of course, there was no air conditioning or anything like that available. These rear windows slide. The seats fold down. You've got all kinds of space in here. How did I come about this car? Interesting story. This car belonged to a gentleman named Leonard Kolejewski. He was a Korean War hero. He achieved the rank of sergeant. He was awarded the Bronze Star, served his country admirably. Came back from the war, bought this car, I believe in the late 60s, maybe close to the early 70s, and pretty much had it his whole life. He just restored it and fixed it up. He raised some kids. When he passed away, his daughters contacted me and they thought I would like this car because their dad was a fan. And when they did, I, I got the car, I loved it, and we made a, a contribution to the Korean uh, War Veterans Group. Uh, this helps guys out, you know, that have PTSD and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's a great organization and we made a donation in his name and, I, and I, was, I was proud to do it. I mean, he really loved this car and his daughters just thought it was the greatest, and they wanted it to go to a good home, and this is where it'll stay. When I got it, it didn't require any maintenance of any kind. It starts right on the button. It's pretty amazing. As I said, it's got all kinds of interesting little accessories, period things on it. I mentioned the fender skirts, but it's just a good, look at that, solid car. You just get in and you drive. Um, when I was really little, eight, nine, 10, these were all over the place. They built about 35,000 of them, I think, in 1950. Uh, it sold for about $1,800, which was, 
what they call the mid price field. You know, back in those days, you had the low price field, the mid price field, and then the high price field. You know, I just like the way they advertise the car, the car for the working man, you know. Uh, not to say women didn't buy cars in those days, but it was usually guys, and it was for the blue collar guy who was kind of on his way up, as I said, maybe a plumber, maybe a carpenter, maybe a real estate guy. And uh, it was just one of those cars that would always get you there. And I have to admit, it's one of the few cars that starts right on the button. You know, a lot of cars around here, these fancy cars that sit for a while, and maybe put a little starting fluid. This thing just, it just goes. Because by 1950, uh, Chrysler had perfected this engine to a T. Uh, as I said, not the most powerful thing, but certainly the most dependable. It doesn't overheat. I drive it in the summer. It's fine. Uh, and, and people like it. They just gravitate towards it because it's, well, it's just a cute car. You know, it just, it does everything right. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. Come on, let's look under the hood and I'll show you what this engine looks like. Of course, the Plymouth emblem up here, the, the ship. As you can see, it was, uh, <laughs> you really, you're gonna have back trouble if you gotta work on one of these to get in here, but there's not a whole lot to do. As you can see, it's a, got a big one barrel carburetor. Oh boy, that'll give you the power. As I said, 97 horsepower, six volts. I mean, as simple a car as you can imagine. And you know, 100 years from now when you're Bugatti Chiron and your uh, F1 and your P1 McLaren and your LaFerrari and your Enzo don't start, you just turn the key and this thing will go because it's, it's, it's basically that simple. There's not a whole lot to it. You got your generator down here. Here's your battery, oil filter right there. I gotta admit, I don't know how they got in here, but they must, they must have take the hood off these things when they worked on them because it's, uh, it's pretty cramped, but there's not a lot to do. Just get in it and drive it. Come around the back, I'll show you some of the cool features. And this car had some interesting period accessories. You know, when I was a kid, there was something called the J.C. Whitney catalog, which is still around, but when I was a kid, it was huge. You could get every automobile accessory from, you know, legitimate stuff like intake manifolds to wolf whistles and all this kind of goofy stuff. This is a fun, thing from that period. It looks like an antique stoplight that you'd have in an intersection maybe in the late 40s or mid 50s. And it's attached to the electrical system of your car. When you step on the brake, the red light and the caution lights light up and flash. And then this flashes to signal your direction. Um, you also have directional indicators here. I'm not sure if they had directional indicators back in 1950 when this came out because it's an aftermarket unit on the uh, steering column. I believe this, this was a basic Suburban model. They built a model called the Deluxe Suburban, which had a lot of period accessories. And I think Leonard, when he restored it, put a lot of those on. For example, this had dog dish hubcaps when it came. Now it's got the full wheel covers and it's got, you see a backup light here and a few other little things. But this is the real genius of this car. You open this up here and then you, Loosen those and that seat folds down so you can get plywood or anything in here. And here's something kind of cool. You know, now when something breaks, you go on the internet, you look it up, you Google it. But see, back in the day, you just reached in the back and you got, ah, oh, look at that, a service manual. Ah, oh, ah, oh, look, you can fix a whole car with everything here. Look, don't need a computer, don't need an iPhone, just all you need a pair of eyes and then this book, it's all right in here. Uh, need parts? Oh, no problem. I'll see, just, it's all right there. It's unbelievable. Yeah. They would print these on printing presses and they would hand it to you, you see, and you could keep it. So you didn't need a computer, didn't have to pay a monthly fee. Once you got this book, it was yours for life. Yeah. It doesn't get lost in the cloud. Just keep in the back of the car. goes up like this, and you secure it here, and here, and then you locked up tight. And this also had, you got your light here for your uh, license plate light. I think a lot of this was added. Uh, I think when Leonard did this, he just tried to find all the proper 
accessories. And it's, it's just a wonderful car to drive, as you'll see in just a minute. Come on, I think we should go for a ride right now. And I'm told a couple of head of cattle got loose out on the North 40, and this is the perfect car to go see what's going on. Always starts. That's a man's horn, son. You've been to this website before. You know I've got another station wagon like this. Uh, that one's got the Dodge 241 Hemi engine, the red ram three-speed with overdrive, and it's pretty quick. It's a fast car. That would be like Dad's car. See, this would be like Mom's car. That was kind of the day. But there's just something that's so relaxing about driving this, you know? The whole world slows down. We've got all this glass area. Visibility is excellent. Everything was optional on these cars. When you, when you bought these new, you just got an empty box, and then you just would put accessories on it. And Leonard did a wonderful job of finding a lot of the correct period accessories. You've got a huge heater, big down, big heater down below, and you've got an air conditioning system here just by pressing this, and you open that up and it pulls air in from the front vent. You know, if you're not in any hurry, this is a great way to travel. This car was not slow by the standard of the day. <clears throat> it was about average. 1950 is still well before the interstate freeway system, so most roads were two-lane roads where people traveled between 45 and 60 miles an hour. I mean, I remember doing it as a little kid. The family around the corner from us, the Boss family, they had one of these. And, you know, we'd pile all the kids in it, go to Richardson's Ice Cream, you know, and get a cone. That was like a huge deal, you know. No power steering, no power brake. But you didn't need it. The car only weighs 3,160 pounds, something like that, which is considered lightweight these days for even the most high-performance cars. You know, a lot of people would find this kind of car and, you know, stick some kind of Chevy 350 in it and do the whole deal. But, you know, I don't know. I Keeping it original just, uh, just seems like more fun to me. You know, it's more fun to kind of drive the car as the way it was intended to be. Because it's not a modern car. No matter what you do to it, you're not really going to make it a modern car. And if you upgrade the engine, then you got to upgrade the brakes. And then I'm not sure what you have at that point. I think it'll always be worth more as it sits right now. Just a nice, original old girl. This was all of Leonard's notes. He would keep, every time he did something to it, replace that in 2007. Okay, new bearings and axles and differential. Upholstery done at 12, 1976. Oh, there we go. stuff I found in the glove box. It says here, my new Plymouth is equipped with a new type automatic choke and combination ignition starter switch that makes starting procedures a snap. And this is when manuals actually told you how to do stuff. It tells you in here how to change a tire. Now they just say, see your dealer. What, do you got a flat? Oh my God, call the dealer. I love the fact that everybody wore a jacket and tie when they drove, see? That's kind of cool. Look at that. See, they, got, they got a jacket and tie on there. Oh, we're not going to go for a drive? Hang on, honey. Let me get dressed. See, there was uh, the standard station wagon right there with the wood. See, mine's got the all steel body. All your engine information is here. Pretty cool. 
Here's that other thing I was. Remember that that J.C. Whitney accessory I showed you in the rear window? Okay. Traffic guide, a must for today's safe drivers. Let me pull that out. I love the fact that Leonard saved all this stuff. Here's yeah, a traffic guide signal. Once again, there's another picture of Leonard right there. Look how proud he is of the car. I think it's great. That's really terrific. Let's see what this is. This is, let's see what this is. Traffic guide installation. I see, there you go. That's how to put it in your rear, in your rear window. See, there you go. I love the fact that Leonard saved all this stuff. Makes me realize I gotta save all the stuff on my car for the next owner, because you don't really own these cars, you just sort of save it for the next person, you know? I always carry Leonard's picture in the car because, well, this is his car, he did all the work on it. When people ask me about the original owner, I just take out and I go, there he is right there, look how proud he is. Yeah. And again, this is his little book where he kept all the notes. First engine overhaul, 10, 1971. Had 40,000 miles on it back then. What do we got now? Yeah, 40,000, must have been around once. Cause that's 50 years ago. Tie rod ends are placed, 1976. Boy, he really kept uh, uh, an accurate journal. New wiring harness. New fuel pump. I love the fact that people save just regular cars like this. It's not a fancy car or a big Hemi engine or anything like that. It's just a good old girl. There's your Firestone travel log. Auto re more auto records in here. Lubrication. This looks like the one he must have used when he first got the car. It looks like an old-fashioned record book. Cleaned air cleaner, 1971. Oh, here, bought it at 11 4 1970 This was, car was built in San Diego. Put a new brake switch in in 71. Rebuilt the carb in 71. Heavy-duty rear shocks in 73. Boy, just everything in here. Every oil change, every bit of lubrication. Just gives a wonderful history of the vehicle. But come on, let's go drive it some more. You know, it's so funny to drive a car that it's similar to the kind of cars you drove around when you were a kid. Because I never feel like an adult driving this car. I feel like I'm driving my dad's car. You know, the adults that drove you around, I realize I'm probably 25 years older now than they were when I was a kid. But they seem so old, they seem so big. Sit behind, I remember being a little kid and sitting in my dad's lap, driving the 49 Plymouth, you know, getting to hold on to the steering wheel. It just seemed like the biggest wheel in the world, and it still seems that way. The best thing you can do with an old car like this is drive it, just use it. You know, people let them sit, and then the water sits in the block, it doesn't circulate, then it begins to corrode. You know, something like this you want to take out, eh, maybe a couple of times a month, run a few arms with it. Always let an old car like this run for at least 40 minutes or an hour or so, just to get everything hot and get everything sort of flushed out, you know? As you can say, I'm using my $3 optional Mera. It's almost hard to believe the cars didn't come with these back in the day, but they did. You had to buy everything. I just like the way it looks going down the road, you know? The coolest thing about this car is a guy like Leonard could buy it take the whole thing apart himself in his garage and put it back together again.
know, you really can't do that anymore with modern cars. They're too complex, too much electronics, too many special tools needed. These are the only tools you needed to work on this car. Good set of hands, maybe a set of Sears Craftsman wrenches, and you were set. You could keep a car like this running for the rest of your life. I believe the first time I went to a McDonald's was in a car like this. At that time, McDonald's slogan was, we're a family of four can have lunch for hundred dollar. Hamburgers are 15 cents, so four hamburgers are 60 cents. Fries are 15 cents, and drinks were 10 cents or 15 cents for the large one. And you can get enough food to feed everybody for a buck. Pretty good deal. I mean, it's amazing how simple these vehicles were back in the day. Like when you buy a basic car now, it's probably got air conditioning, AF, AM, FM radio, uh, you know, electric windows, all kinds of stuff. Back in the day, you got nothing. You got an engine, you got a three-speed transmission, and you got roll-up windows with sliding windows. Everything else you had to pay extra. You know, this is one of those cars, you either get it or you don't. You know, you just enjoy the sheer mechanicalness of it. You know, the fact that a guy could uh, come home, take it apart and put it together. Uh, Leonard uh, had this car probably more than half his life, I'm guessing. He bought it in 1970, uh, did all the work himself. Uh, I want to thank his daughters, Deborah and Susan, for uh, contacting me and telling me about this car. And uh, thanks, Sergeant Leonard, for being an American hero and for winning the Bronze Star and uh, well, allowing the rest of us to have this kind of a hobby. So let's put his picture up there one more time. There you go. Thank you, Leonard. See you guys next week. Mm-hmm. <laughs>